All right, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Parker, and I'm a member of the marketing team at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar and offer support to our speakers. I'm also joined by our commercial manager of food safety and supply chain, Chris Reno. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to get started. Thanks so much, Parker, and Chris, thanks so much to Perry Johnson for hosting me here today, uh, my name is Rebecca Anderson. I'm the technical manager for Global Gap in North America. My role is to work with certification bodies and training auditors and understanding the requirements and implement, implementation of our standards. And uh, Perry Johnson asked um, to talk about, you know, how did 2023 go and what are we looking at? What's upcoming in 2024? So thanks again to Perry Johnson for hosting and I look forward to spending the next hour with you all um, talking about Global Gap. So this is what we'll discover today. So 2023 in review, looking at some statistics, our new IT systems and for CBs and producers, really talking about some common non-compliances and how we're able to track those actually. And then we'll spend most of our time on Looking ahead, that means really digging into IFA version six, some of the timelines, our other standards, and changes that might be happening with those, and our FISMA 204, um, and what we're doing with that. Just briefly, uh, most of you are already familiar with Global Gap, but I just want to send the reminder that we um, have one objective that's safe and sustainable agriculture worldwide. Um, some of you all think of Global Gap um, and only think of food safety, but really we're trying to remind and send the message that we do talk about sustainability and it is already included in our standards. And a reminder that we are, you know, voluntary standards. So those of you with us and participating with us and certified to us, you can choose other standards. And so, you know, just thank you all for coming along this journey with us. Um, we are a brand. Global Gap is a, a brand actually of different solutions. So when I talk about other standards, these are other solutions. So if we're thinking of, you know, most people think of Global Gap, they think of IFA, the Integrated Farm Assurance, but we also have PHA, the Produce Handling Assurance. We have different add-ons. We have harmonized produce safety standards. So all of those fit under the Global Gap brand. Um, and really this idea of safe and sustainable agriculture is making sure farms are recognized for their efforts to produce enough safe food and safeguard the environment and welfare of farming communities, right? It's this idea of um, celebrating the work, hard work that farms do. Um, I said I would share some statistics. So this is where we are in terms of number of producers under certification, and this includes producers under um, group options. So IFA, FE, this is integrated farm assurance, fruits and vegetables. Um, we have 187,000 um, certified producers worldwide. Um, over half of those are also certified to uh, GRASP or have a GRASP letter of conformance. GRASP is our Global Gap Risk Assessment for Social Practices. Um, we have hot producers, um, which is continuing to grow. Our GGFSA, that's the Farm Sustainability Assessment, which is a partnership with the SAI platform. So that's continuing to grow. Spring AHDL, this is a private one for Aldi. FISMA add-on is continuing to be one of the main add-ons. And then we also have chain of custody growing um, as well. And I'll talk more about all of these different standards uh, towards the end of the presentation, but just giving you an idea of where all of the auditors and producers fit in. In North America specifically, um, I only have producers under certification, which seems to be a, a much smaller number compared to, to everywhere else, but um, the North American producers uh, also are about 10% of all the acreage, of the certified acreage worldwide, um, so we make up a huge uh, percentage of, of, of power under the numbers. Um, this year, I don't have comparisons, but HPSS has really taken off. Um, this is about 50% uh, more producers than we had last year. And so we're excited to see HPSS continue to grow as well, chain of custody. Um, it's a small number, but by our, our numbers, that's actually double from last year as well, I believe. 
Um, and then local gap. Local gap is a stepping stone to IFA. We're excited to offer that so people can um, get into certification and then move their way up. So that was some statistics. Um, we are also very excited that we are working in new IT systems with our certification bodies and slowly transitioning them away from our dinosaur of a database. Um, and so we're moving all of our CVs into the certification body accreditation tool or CBAT as Lauren likes to call it. And I appreciate and adopt that. Um, and then we have audit reports. So CBAT is for all the auditor credentials to be uploaded, including their um, uh, training forms, uh, witness assessments, credentials, all things like that. And that tool, the CBAT, is connected to our Audit Online Hub. So Audit Online Hub is where um, in version six, and as we move along this year, we're pushing all the CBs to, to upload all of their audit reports in Audit Online Hub. That way, Global Gap actually has access to the data that's in the audit reports. Um, Prior to having Audit Online Hub, we would have to ask each CB individually and track down the specific uh, report that we're looking for. Um, and all other standards actually already have this. And so we're just uh, finally catching up, really. So the CBAT is actually connected to the Audit Online Hub. So the auditor can't complete the report until they're qualified to do it. And then that leads us to certificates generated and validation service. Um, and then this is helping us have uniform certificates across all certification bodies. Um, the uh, signatories on that, whoever authorizes the certificate also needs to be in CBAT. So they're all connected to make sure that um, there's a smart system in place checking and making sure everyone's qualified and, and things have been done on time. And we're really um, hopeful that um, once this is fully uh, everyone is fully on board, it really creates faster audit closures. So not waiting so long for certificates and reports um, because the CBs can actually, uh, they're not frustrated by our IT systems and they can get those out to you. As well as for you know the supply chain and retailers having uniform audit report formats and uniform um, certificate formats and that makes it faster for their process to identify the things that they're specifically looking for in their supplier checks. So, we have you know, introduced these to our certification bodies, and we are also looking ahead to make sure that they are all on board with the system. So I think it's important for the audience to know about these things that we're doing. Um, we expect a, a fee change this year, for example, and this is one of the reasons is to have better IT systems across all of our standards. Additionally, with IT, we have a new website. Um, it may be a little bit frustrating right now, we all probably got used to how to find things on our discombobulated previous website. And now you have to learn again how to find things. Um, and that's also you know, why I'm here. So you can just ask me what, whatever you need, I can provide it. But um, we are excited about it and want you to know about it. And there should be a feedback form on there if you are missing something or having a hard time, um, just let us know about it. Um, but uh, these are all things of Global Gap trying to catch up to the 21st century and finally uh, being there. So that's about um, some of our operational things in 2023 that happened. Um, Perry Johnson also asked that we talked about these uh, common non-compliances that we saw in 2023, and this is for producers and QMS and certification bodies. And we're able to find these now because we have the audit online hub and we can check what are the non-compliances and which ones are um, mostly repeated. We can even see which auditors have um, write different non-compliances. So in one instance, one auditor was writing a very similar non-compliance across several different producers, right? So now we can track these kinds of things and, and, and trend these. So um, I think that's a really important tool for us as we move forward and, and try to adhere to continuous improvement. So I've broken these up into different sections. The first one is entities related to general documentation. And um, the first one is having a continuous improvement plan. This was in IFA 5.4-1-GFS. All of these are taken from our fruits and vegetables, IFA 5.4-1-GFS, because I thought that is what you would be most interested in. Um, and all of these, I believe, will be also included in version six. So knowing about them now and preparing for them, I think, 
is important for you. So getting that continuous improvement plan, finding something on the farm um, that the producer chooses that they can decide, you know, what is the next step? And then looking back and say, did I achieve that? And if not, what do I need to do um, to achieve that continuous improvement? That's gonna be a major must in version six. So uh, looking at getting that done now. Um, specifications not written. So for seed vendors, chemical suppliers, pest control, um, this means before we hire our pest control company, what do we need to see from them? We need to see that they have their licenses and that their insurance is up to date. For example, this is you know not what GlobalGet requires, but what your specifications should say on the farm. And then that being a part of the approved supplier program. So um, a lot of places where specifications were not written. AF732 and 733, these are energy efficiency plans and renewable energy plans not being available. These are both recommendations, but energy efficiency plan will be a minor must, I believe in version six, renewable energy would still be a recommendation. So having some sort of plan for energy efficiency, retailers are really concerned about environmental sustainability at this point, trying to figure out how to start tracking that. And so the sooner that we can get on board with um, having plans and implementation and reporting, um, the easier it is for the supply chain. And then uh, lastly, related to documentation would be in the recall and withdrawal procedures, making sure that there's a notification clause to the certification body in case of a recall. So adding that line into our recall plans. Um, the next category is entities related to workers. Um, and this picture is just a demonstration video from the University of Washington. So. Um, Obviously, it looks different than this, but you get the idea. Um, so what we have seen across workers is um, having expired first aid kit items. Uh, so the requirement is that they're up to date and there are certain items in the first aid kit that expire. And just being careful that if you're providing expired materials to workers, that that can come back to the producer in a negative way. And we've seen that happen before. Um, then also, when auditors are talking with the workers, um, the workers need to be aware of where those for, for safe kits are, if they're in the vehicles or if they're at the water station, for example, um, making sure workers are trained about that. Then we see missing hygiene training for management. So the requirement is that all persons on the farm, um, respective to their job, are trained in food safety. So maybe there's a salesperson in the office that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the plant, but maybe they're providing tours to customers. Right now they're walking through the facility, now they need to be trained, now they need to tell visitors what to do. So we would see hygiene training for that person as well. Um, wearing jewelry while handling products, I think this is like uh, a never ending non-compliance that we've seen since the beginning of go uh, good agriculture practices. Um, so just being aware of that in the field and also handling. Then we see health and safety risk assessments not being appropriate to the job and location. So a lot of times producers will have um, generic risk assessments that they can adopt on their farm, but uh, they don't tailor them to their farm. So they miss things that are specific to that specific location or area. So in this case, um, we saw a lot where heat stress was specifically missing as well as smoke and fire hazards were missing. Um, so just making sure those risk assessments are tailored. And then the last one, which is pretty difficult, is this health checks not being provided. So this is where you have workers on the farm who are exposed to certain levels of toxicity or certain types of chemicals need to have um, health checks available. Um, and that is gonna look different depending on the legal requirements, uh, depending on the specific availability in that area, but making sure there's some sort of you know, examination or blood check or um, physical check, uh, just to make sure that the workers that are exposed to these pesticides at certain levels um, don't have long-term health impacts. So this one is pretty challenging, but it is part of the health and safety requirements. The next NCs were related to plant protection products. Um, so li liquid pesticides stored on wooden pallets, this is also a never ending argument. So pesticides come in in boxes on, pallets um, that would be closed containers and we consider that fine. But once that uh, liquid pesticide is being used and then being stored, then we wanna make sure that there's some liquid containment for that. So I think um, this is talking about open 
containers uh, being on those wood pallets. Um, and the idea is that it needs to be on a non-absorbable sort of, sort of sh uh, shelving. And then for uh, plant protection products or chemicals, not having uh, the residue test available at the time of the audit. Sometimes we have audits occurring, uh, you know, the first two days of harvest and the MRL results aren't available yet for that particular season. And so basically the auditor has to write a non-conformance until the MRL is available and then close out the non-conformance at that time. So trying to, you know, time your audits as best as possible to make sure you have everything on file. Um, we don't generally see people not doing it. It's just a matter of the timing that hasn't worked out is what I've noticed. So that's related to plant protection products. And so really those are the common non-compliances across the IFA 5.4-1 that's GFS for fruits and vegetables. And um, I think those are pretty manageable um, if we're looking at it holistically. And so just being aware of those maybe pain points. And of course, there's things that, you know, are specific farm to farm um, that weren't included in the list, but those are just the aggregated uh, ones that made it to the top. For QMS, for quality management systems, um, the QMS, um, is supposed to review the qualifications for the internal auditor. So it's just a matter of making sure all of those documents are on file and that they are adequately addressing the question. And so um, the internal QMS needs to check that before the certification body comes in and does the check. Um, then there's internal inspector and auditor training missing. So if there's more than one inspector or one auditor, um, then there needs to be an internal calibration training annually for those people. And so that has been missing. And then um, again, this idea of notification to the CB in case of a recall. So this was missing in the recall withdrawal procedure. So not too bad for QMS. Um, at this point, we see our QMSs are operating at a pretty high level um, if these are what's missing. So just sharing that with you to be aware of it, things that we're looking for and uh, some improvement that can be made for the QMS systems. And then I wanted to talk about some common CB errors because this is posted by a certification body. Um, one area of concern that we have is that CBs are incorrectly scoping farm management companies. So this is where perhaps a landowner is absentee and they have hire out, basically, basically subcontract a farm management company to do all of the growing, all of the labor, all of the harvesting, all of the selling, right? And so what will happen is sometimes CBs will put all of those farm management companies under an option one or an option two. And in some cases they could be an option two if the farm management company is actually selling the product. Um, but if the land owner isn't renting out the land or it's not leased to the farm management company, the land owner is technically still the responsible person and needs to be an option one um, certificate holder. So that's one issue. Then we have CBs not visiting product handling units. So this may apply to you as well as producers. Um, but when product handling is included, even if the product is um, the product handling is not owned by the producer, say you go to 100 different growers, all have individual option one, and they all go to the same packing house, that packing house still should be visited by the auditor, even if it has GFSI recognition, like SQF or BRC. Um, and then the auditor just checks uh, traceability, segregation, and um, plant protection products. And so um, that still needs to be checked. And we had cases where the CBs weren't going out to visit the handling units, even though it should take about maybe 30 minutes or something like this. So be aware that that's something that we're acknowledging. And, and if you're in that situation where you're a producer and your product goes to a different packer, but you still own it and still have handling, including on your certificate that we will be going to the pack house. Um, and then one was that they weren't visiting it. And then additionally, um, uh, CBs weren't including the product, even though it was still uh, owned by the producer. So if the product is still owned by the producer, then um, we would also include that on the certificate. There are some exclusion caveats, um, but you can ask those in the questions if, if we need to. So sharing this with you as a certification body, as auditors, as producers out there, so you're aware that these are occurring and, and we're aware of them and, and working on them with our certification body. 
so that's really it for 2023 and i'll move on to looking ahead and really starting with ifa version 6 which probably most of you need to know about or are most interested in and we actually released ifa version 6 in 2022 so we've been working on it all of 2023 um, we've been going through the gf site benchmarking process for it um, and um, this year we we finally expected to be uh, re replacing 5.4-1 so um you know that there are two versions of ifa version 6 so we have the gfs and we have the smart uh, gfs is specifically for that gfsi benchmarking and smart is for everyone else and you're, everyone asks why are there two editions and this is because not everyone needs gfs in fact about 60 percent of our our certificates are non-gfsi which means that um, it's a big enough difference that we need to have two different editions. Um, that said, less than 15% of the principles and criteria are different. Um, so that means some are you know, majors and GFS where they're minors and smarts, or um, there's some wording differences, things like that. And there's one more criteria in GFS. So um, in terms of principles and criteria, they're not that different, but in terms of the rules, the rules around GFSI are different requiring um, no sampling for high-risk producers for groups. That's something we couldn't uh, really negotiate. So the rules themselves are quite different between SMART and GFS, which is the main reason we needed to have two different editions. So SMART is, it's all outcome oriented. The checklists are more flexible. Um, we say it's by stakeholders for stakeholders, whereas the GFS, we have to adopt their requirements verbatim uh, in some cases. and so. That's why we say SMART is a little bit more flexible. Um, so GFS is for uh, producers who require that GFSI recognition. This is mostly, um, if we're talking about Global Gap in North America, we are generally talking about IFA version 6 GFS, or like you're doing now, IFA 5.4-1 GFS, right? So the rules and checklists are really determined by these GFSI requirements. So a lot of things will be the same if you choose Global Gap versus some other standard. Right, um, but in any case, they're all accepted, you know, at, for moving forward to that um, next step. So what does it include? Uh, the same thing that you have now, right? This is all responsible farming practices, food safety, environmental sustainability, workers' well-being, And then we added different categories, legal management, traceability, but it's things you've already been doing, right? This is the food safety plan and policy um, designating people. And in version six, we move from control points and compliance criteria to principles and criteria. We're trying to move to an outcome base rather than describe exactly what the producer needs to do, which in some cases can be quite frustrating, but uh, in a lot of other cases, it gives the producers more flexibility on how they want to actually handle the outcome requirement. And we've also added metrics uh, this year, which all are recommendations, but important for uh, producers start to start keeping track. So um, we've also removed a little bit of the duplication, like having uh, water testing requirements in, all, in crop space and in fruits and vegetables checklist. So now it's just one checklist. So it says FE GFS, and then it's uh, basically sections one through uh, 32, I believe. So there's 191 principles and criteria. There's still minor must, major must, and recommendations. Still having to complete 100% of the majors and 95% of the minors and having the corrective action still due within 28 days. So as people move from 5.41 to version six, it will still be a subsequent audit. So you will still need the 28 days. What does it look like? We have um, food safety having uh, 44 principles and criteria. You can see the environmental sustainability criteria really heavily increase this time. Legal management, traceability, production processes. <clears throat> this is like, um, uh, record keeping, soil management, applications, things like that, all are part of production processes. And then workers' well being is, is 22 of the questions. We also still have energy efficiency, um, still have integrated pest management, fertilizers, uh, biodiversity, but it's been widened. Waste management has been um, expanded as well, and then still water management. So, all the topics that you're still familiar with in Global Gap. Um, this is just an example. So it says principle and criteria, but this will pretty much look um, the same for you. 
so here's an example. There's evidence that the provided uh, PPE is used by the workers. There shall be evidence that the PPE is being used. For example, um, the supply maintained on hand corresponds to the needs of workers or, or records demonstrating that new PPE is promptly sourced and restocked and shall be available. So it's saying um, you still have some flexibility in how you meet this, but making sure that the PPE is used. So that would be an example. Um, in terms of food safety, um, continuous improvement was already in 5.4-1-DFS. It was not in 5.2, but there has been um, improvements to that principle and criteria. And actually it's two principles and criteria now. So one is, is there a plan? And the second one, is it implemented? For continuous improvement, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to food safety. It can be related to any part of the checklist, um, but just saying that that has been enhanced. And then the next thing related to food safety is that treated water used during harvest and post-harvest is monitored appropriately. This was embedded, I would say, in the current checklist and everyone is pretty much doing it, but this is the first time we're explicitly saying it in the checklist. For environmental sustainability, we say biodiversity is managed and supported with metrics. So this is producers getting a baseline of the types of um, plants and animals and <clears throat> creatures that are on their farm, which is probably a weird word, but the idea to understand you know, what's there and then the next step is how to protect it and the next step is how to enhance it, right? So coming up with a measurement and then um, moving forward in improvement. Uh, then we talked about ecosystem and habitats not being converted into agricultural areas. So this is not saying arable land that's appropriate for growing. This is saying um, producers are not cutting down forests and then making that into agricultural areas. So we have some of that in the US, um, maybe in the Southeast, for example, those um, naturally forested areas. But this is also a standard that applies across all commodities. So we're also talking here about you know rainforest being cut down for um, uh, palm oil. So um, having these principles and criteria relate to um, the producers and their production areas and their product in, in um, a way that makes sense, right? So uh, it has to be flexible enough to all be applied in the U.S., but also in Brazil, for example. And the next one is plastics are managed in a responsible way. So having plastic management plan, trying to reduce plastics. Um, you're probably aware of the um, Canadian ban on plastics for food packaging, which I think, um, you know, there's some action and activity related to that. So uh, just catching up with that. Integrated pest management plan, all of our producers are already doing integrated pest management plan, making sure there's actually, um, um, not only a plan, but, but checking on to see if it worked and uh, seeing if there's improvements needed next time. And remembering that our integrated pest management plan in IFA fruits and vegetables also meets the Walmart pollinator requirements. So we'll talk about that later. Um, and so we've made some changes to version six to make sure that is also true in version six. And um, fertilizers, biostimulants stored in a manner that reduces environmental contamination, just uh, meeting some of those requirements. So yeah, just mentioning again that we already meet those Walmart pollinator requirements, which is great for you as producers. You don't have to add another standard. Um, you just keep going with integrated farm assurance. Additional um, recommendations uh, for, for environment and sustainability. So we talked about metrics already. So metrics would be um, at the end of the month, how much, how much N, P, or K was um, applied to a specific area, how much water is applied, how much energy is being used in plant protection products. And so this looks a little daunting, right? Um, but most producers are already keeping records of all of these things. It's a matter of calculating them on a regular basis. So adding a total. There's also other programs like the CISC, the California Specialty Crops, I gotta look it up on the internet, CISC calculator. But you can help manage these metrics and also come up with uh, plans on how to improve with things like that. These are completely free to growers and they're built and developed in the US using specialty crops, using you know apples and, and uh, leafy greens and all of these things. Um, so I'll, I'll mention that again, uh, stewardship index for specialty crops, CISC. Um, 
and I could provide a link if you need that. So there are tools for producers to use that are free um, and that we promote um, in order to get that information. Food waste is prevented. On the farm, this should really be called food lost. And that's just a matter of um, you know, trying to, instead of throwing away produce, right, find a secondary outlet for that because um, food waste is what the number three source of, of greenhouse gases, right? Um, the farm enables the formation of organic carbon in soils and biomass. So this is if you have tree fruit and um, you have <clears throat> cuttings that you could spread along the minerals or having cover crops, things that producers are already doing that's already supporting carbon sequestration. A producer recognizes the farm as an agriculture ecosystem. So being aware of what your neighbors are doing and letting your neighbors know what you're doing, being part of um, local environmental projects or water projects. And then uh, farms contribution to reducing and re removing greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. So um, it starts with being able to, to have a metrics and have a baseline um, supporting themselves with being able to do like a, a carbon footprint or, or GHG calculator, which are you know ubiquitous on um, online, for example. So we don't say what you have to do to um, do the to to which tools you have to use, for example, um, and and it leaves that up to the producer. But we just need to say we say this needs to be started recorded. So right now these are all recommendations. It might seem a little bit scary. It's just trying to introduce the idea to at the producer level. For workers' well-being, there were two new control points. Um, again, this idea of personal protective equipment. So we talked about that as an example. And then the last one is the workers are informed of their rights related to their grievance mechanism and making sure that um, complaints can be submitted in a confidential way and without fear of retaliation. So this is a step beyond what we've been um, asking for in terms of workers having this two-way communication um, and making sure that workers can and are informed of their rights. Um, this next slide is on continuous improvement. Um, it just is a little more detail in order to come up with a plan. Uh, and you can look up these if you, you can make your own like plan, do, check and act. So each one of these are a little bit different. It's up to the producer to choose what activity they, they choose as continuous improvement, and then come up with their own plan to check and do. Um, and just a reminder that version six is a subsequent audit. Um, and one I didn't even include it into the presentation, but what that also means is that for version six, um, you could have version six, your first audit as an unannounced audit. We've moved away in version six um, of audits being Unannounced audits being in addition. So typically you would have your announced audit, get your recertification, and then you have a 10% chance of being selected for an unannounced audit. But moving into version six, it's a 10% chance of being selected for the recertification audit. So your version six audit has a 10% chance of being an unannounced audit. Um, I think I will add a slide to that. This next one. So timeline, so IP Smart is already in use. This was um, obligatory for, yeah, obligatory starting January 1st of this year. Um, same thing for hops. Uh, for version six, everyone says, well, what's the timeline? Um, and it's really all about the GFSI benchmarking process. So we have been in the GFSI uh, process since August of last year when we applied, maybe even sooner than that. Right now we're currently in, um, a public consultation. So GFSI holds their own public consultation for every standard that goes through benchmarking. Um, and then we have, they have six weeks to put a report together and then we respond to any of the comments if there are comments and then they um, have to approve each standard by their board. So it depends on when their next board meeting is. And then after that, we would get recognition. So I can never tell you what that timeline is gonna be like. It just depends on if there are comments how long it takes them to put their uh, comments together, how long it takes us to respond, how long it takes for the board to meet. So all of these things are just dependent upon that. So when we have recognition, we'll have a three months transition. So we'll notify all of our CBEs, we'll have a news blast. Um, so you will get that information and then you'll have additionally three months to um, get ready. So 
What we're encouraging people to do now is to make sure that they're ready for either, especially if you have an audit maybe around August, September, July, August, September, go either way. And then hopefully after that point, um, we will have uh, recognition. Um, HAPS, again, already in, in required as of January 1st. There is a transition tool. Um, if you don't have this already, please, I'll get that to you. So this has um, version six, so you can see FE GFS 01 right next to version five. So you can see what you had already and what you need to get to. Um, and you can answer yes or no and have your justification. And then there's a, another tab in the Excel which will calculate your score for you actually, as long as you're answering all of these yes or no. So you can see where you are in comparison to version five uh, to, com to compare to version six. And I think this is one of the greatest tools that you can all have access to. And so please let me know if you don't have that or let Lauren know or, or Chris or Parker and we can get that to you. So that was about version six. I wanna talk a little bit about other standards, a PHA, HPS, ESS, Workers' Wellbeing, and then FISMA 204. FISMA 204 is not our standard, but we'll talk about that. So, as I said, Global Gap is a, a brand and we have different solutions depending on what people need. So we have local gap, HPSS, PHA, chain of custody. And I said HPS because we're changing that this year from HPSS to HPSS to HPS. Sorry, one S, one S. And then different add-ons. Um, so harmonized produce safety standard will become HPS. This is a food safety only standard. This is basically, we work with United Fresh. We license the um, combined harmonized standard, the uh, produce gaps harmonization initiative basically created a, um, its own standard. So we license that from IFPA and then we add a few control points for traceability and for GFSI benchmarking. And then um, this is a food safety only standard. So here <clears throat> Johnson also offers this. So HPS will go, is in revision right now. So IFPA released a new standard last year, May 2023. We have one year to update our standard. We have the documents finalized and basically we're working on the IT system. So we'll have the HPS launched in June, 2024. Um, we'll have to apply for continued recognition of HPSS. So that will take you know several months, up to nine months to achieve this GFSI recognition. And then HPS version two replaces um, HPSS version 1.2. Um, so we have to make this a new version from version one to version two. <clears throat> Um, because of the significance of changes um, from the harmonized standard as well. So expect that you'll see um, an updated version of HPS if that's what you choose. Additionally, a similar situation for PHA, our produce handling assurance, if you weren't aware of that. This is a standalone um, accredited standard for cooling, packing, repacking, and handling and storage. Um, it can be combined, so you could do IFA plus PHA or HPS plus PHA, and it's really a way to streamline those audits, um, or it can be just, you know, a packer themselves doing their certification. This does have GFSI recognition as well. So PHA also went through a revision. So because they all depend on IFA general regulations, all of our standards and add-ons had to go through uh, some sort of revision. So for PHA, um, we have, Finalize the documents, we'll launch that in April. Um, we'll apply for GFSI recognition. Um, we hope that might be a little faster than HPSS because we're going from version one, two to version one, three. Um, and then once we have that recognition, the version 1.3 replaces version 1.2. So similar situation. Uh, then we have um, chain of custody. Chain of custody is for the supply chain in order to, for the supply chain to make use the GGN or other global gap identification number like the PHA number, make a global gap certification claim or participate in our GGN logo. So this is an on-product logo. If, if you're not already familiar, we use it pretty extensively in flowers and aquaculture, but very little in fruits and vegetables. People are, are a little hesitant to you know, claim food safety on products, but it's really claiming responsible farming practices. So I think there's a mind shift there in terms of how a label is used. So when producers want to use the label or a supply chain uh, entity wants to use the label, for example, then you need to have a verified certification through that process. And so that's why we have chain of custody. So the packers, the brokers, so even um, 
you know, the independent uh, people where just ownership changes, but the product doesn't physically actually go to their facilities. Um, these people are part of that chain as well. So everyone in the supply chain needs to be certified. Um, so when I said that, it's specifically growing because we are seeing more label uses and also because this idea of making a Global Gap certification claim. So this is like an exporter saying all of my product is Global Gap certified. Well, they need to back that up and make sure they have um, the COC claim the uh, certification themselves. So um, COC was going through a small revision. Um, so not a major change, but you'll see a new chain of custody standard this year as well. Um, then we have GRASP add-on version two. This is probably uh, the most significant change of any add-ons um, where we're going from version 1.3 dash I dash, I don't know, there's a lot of digits behind that. But now we're going to version two. Um, we still have these main topics. So representation, good social practices, na national labor regulations, working contracts, pay slips and wages, time reporting systems and working hours. But we have really bulked out that um, criteria list. And it went from, I think, 13 main sections to 62 individual questions. So really big jump. We've actually already switched to GRASP version two. So even if you're using 5.4.1, you're supposed to move to GRASP version two. Um, and there's the way that the certification bodies can do that already. Um, because the retailers are demanding social responsibility on the farm. Um, and so if you're not already aware of this, uh, start to you know, look at it and, and um, getting familiar with the topics. Um, IFA and GRASP were aligned already with the Ethical Charter. Ethical Charter was an initiative from the IFPA, International Fresh Produce Association. They said, okay, what are all the main topics and all of the main principles that farms should be doing? Farms and produce businesses in general should be doing. Um, and they laid out an extensive list of uh, practices, which, which they called the Ethical Charter. Previously, the ethical charter was a self-declaration, so a produce farm could um, sign up with the ethical charter that they conform to these principles, but there was previously no verification. Um, and so now retailers are asking for, first, they're asking for um, self-assessments, basically, and then the next step, in certain high-risk commodities or regions, they'll be asking for um, audits and verification. So, We've already aligned with the ethical charter in the past, but now um, there was an initiative called Ethical Charter Implementation Program, which is where retailers are signing on to the implementation program. It has surveys that they send out to their supply chain. Um, and then based upon that, uh, you know, they're gathering information of who should have hot audits. So um, because we are, were already aligned with the ethical charter, we went through their own benchmarking program and what it means is if Target, for example, says I need you to participate in the ethical charter implementation program, and then the producer has to go on and do a survey. And then they basically say, okay, did I pay plus grass? And then here's my audit report. And then you basically get some sort of gold star in their system. So you don't have to go any further than that. So it's basically a rating system and meaning that Global Gap plus IFA plus grass is at the higher end of that rating system. Um, so right now it's surveys and then audits depending on the supply chain, but in any case, um, I think plus grass meets the requirements within that system up to 90%, which is pretty high for their uh, benchmark. Uh, that's probably a, a very short way to say that. It's probably more confusing now, um, but if you're you know, working with a supply chain and you have to do ESIP or ethical chart implementation program, um, know that I think GRASP is a good solution for that. Um, other things to look forward to, we are publishing a workers' well-being standard in 2025. We'll have a public consultation period sometime this year for that. This is basically for, so we already have IF8 plus GRASP for the farm, but this is for anyone else. And um, so this could be in the packing house or this could be um, like the farm labor contractors, for example. So other entities needing to have verification of uh, yeah, farm labor practices um, and supporting the agriculture industry that way. So we actually uh, wrote that uh, in 2023. No, in 2020, yeah, in 2023, we'll be working on it through 2024 and it'll be available in 2024. 
I so have your say by waiting and looking for that for public consultation. And then we have the environmental sustainability solution. Um, this is something that's been asked for for a long time. So this could be an add-on to our IFA right now. So this just instead of those metrics being recommendations, they go into you know minor must or major must, for example. And then there's verification throughout the supply chain, which is another reason chain of custody is so important because then they have to verify those environmental um, claims. Um, but it has the same uh, topics we talked about earlier, but it actually goes deeper into regenerative agriculture. So that's basically how everything you know works together, food waste um, and also footprinting. So IFA touches on these things, has some as recommendations, ESS goes further. So this can actually be an add-on or it can be its own standard. So say that there's producers that are doing, uh, you know, Primus GFS and they needed an environmental solution. They could do Primus for food safety and then um, ESS for environmental. So that's the idea behind the ESS. There will be a public consultation for that, a second public consultation between March and April of this year. We already had some in 2023, and then the standard should be available in 2025. And then um, briefly, I wanted to talk about, so those are standards within the Global Gap suite of solutions. Um, we've been having questions about FISMA 204, and I'm just making the assumption that you already know about the food traceability rule and that the traceability rule is the same thing as FISMA 204. FISMA 204 is just the uh, section number for the US law. And then food traceability rule is what the FDA calls the rule. Um, so in this rule, each um, part of the supply chain, which is a critical tracking event or, yeah. Um, so like the harvester, the packing, the cooler, the shipping, the receiving, each one of those needs to have a food traceability plan and they need to have specific records and they need to share the records with the next person in the supplier chain, so their customer. Um, those include uh, the date something was um, harvested or, or changed, uh, how much it was, um, but importantly, um, they need to also share this traceability lot code source and reference guidance. And so, We've been trying to work out, you know, how producers can, first of all, they come up with a lot code with their, their G10 and um, uh, some other number, but their lot code source and reference guidance can't actually be a GGN as their possible uh, lot code source reference. With a disclaimer um, right now that the GGN can only be used for producers that have uh, one farm and one location where they pack. So, at the initial packing, say it's like cantaloupe packed in the field, and that's uh, farm A. So that can be, um, the GGN can be used in that situation. But if there's farm B, farm C, farm, farm block D, and those are all different locations, then the GGN could not be used. And we're coming up with a solution for that. And I don't have, um, we have about five proposals internally that we need to seek consultation for and, and then move forward. And so we have basically a year to do that. But at this point, if it's one farm, one location where everything is occurring, then the GGN can be used for this lot code source reference. So we've been working with the um, PTI Working Group, that's the Produce Traceability Initiative, and that's hosted by basically United uh, International Fresh Produce Association, Canada, Canadian Produce Marketing Association, GS1 Canada, GS1 US. Um, so they're all part of this Produce Traceability Initiative, as you see here, they're coming up with a guidance document that um, will include, you know, this traceability lot code source reference and GGN is already listed in this guidance that will be published hopefully within the next month. So um, that's exciting. We are trying to be on the forefront. We're trying to create value with it using the GGN, something you already have as cert certified producers and making sure it's usable in, in other ways. Um, because the GGN is tied to a legal entity through GS1, we're able to offer this in, in a way that no other standard can. So that's really exciting news. Um, but we are coming up with some solution for producers that have more than one uh, pack location. And so stay tuned for that. Um, so that's all I really wanted to share with you. That's looking back at 2023, looking ahead at where we're going and some things that we're working on. And if we're not a part of something that you think we need to we need to be, please let us know. Um, and then you know you could you know talk to Lauren, talk to Parker, talk to Chris, um, or you know send us an email as well. 
I didn't put my email, um, but we generally filter everything through our customer support at globalgap.org or standard support at globalgap.org. So you can get a hold of us and ask your questions um, and then visit our brand new website, which you know is a little clunky right now, but it won't get better. And finally, I do want to direct you to you know, Perry Johnson. And again, thank you to Perry Johnson. Thanks to Lauren for your continued partnership. Um, and and uh, Chris and, and Patrick and Kristen for uh, supporting this webinar and, and you know, supporting Global Gap and, and helping us spread the word as well. So thank you to all of you and thank you all for your time. Um, yeah, I don't know thank you right. so much, Rebecca. Uh, you know, on behalf of PGR FSI, um, there aren't any questions today. Obviously, you guys have been busy. There's a lot of things in the works with new revisions coming out. Um, from Global Gap and the family of brands, you know, we might have to make this a monthly segment right now. You guys have so much going on. But, you know, really thank you for your time today. It was a very informative presentation. Um, you know, it's a really, um, you know, looking forward to a great year with you guys. So if any questions come in, you know, please don't hesitate to send them either to myself or directly to Global Gap. Um, if you will give us about 24 hours, to get the uh, show rebroadcast and put on our website. We'll send out links for you, as well as information on future webinars and how to sign up for those. So really thank you for your time today and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.